Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, so I'm Stefan Koy from Safran. I'm in charge of research, technology and innovation at Safran. So you may not know Safran, uh, but I must say Safran is not a startup, it's a big group. Significant size, 17 billion euro, 70,000 people, and we are a big player in aerospace and defense equipment. One of our main activity is aircraft engines. So you may not know, but if you're flying, and I'm sure you do, on Boeing 737 or an Airbus 320, you're pretty likely to be flying with us because we own 70% of the market share. We do that through a joint venture we've got with General Electric with 50-50 shares. So we are quite proud of that, and today I'd like to try to show what challenges we have for innovation in aircraft engines for the future. The title of my speech is Can Aircraft Fly Without Kerosene? So why such a question? It's because what is driving our research in aerospace is reducing uh, CO2 emission and pollution from, for the aircraft. And what I would like you to take away is that we are working very actively. We've made tremendous progress in the past. But to go where we need to be, we will need new stuff, breakthroughs, innovation. And as you will see, it will end up on large aircraft, but it will start on small ones. So there is a lot of room for innovation for smaller players and startups. So first of all, what are we talking about? Uh, I've got a question for the room, but I know you can, I cannot hear you, so uh, I will figure out the answer. What is the share to, of aviation air transport in CO2 emission, in total CO2 emission of the full world? Uh, our, a friend of ours, Air France, I, I see some people do know, but I'm not interested in people who do know. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd be interested in your opinion. So, uh, a friend of ours, Air France, an airline, asked the question to 6,000 customers. And the answer was, the average opinion is 16% of total CO2 emission from aviation. And we had the correct answer in the room. The correct answer is slightly more than 2%. So first message is, it's not, in fact, it's not as big as you think. And we'll see later why. It's because we've worked a lot to reduce emissions already. However, 2% is still very significant. And one thing we bear in mind is we are growing. Because people tend to want to fly more in developing countries. And so our business is growing by five, 4 to 5% five a year. So that means that in one or two decades, if we don't do anything, which is not an option, we would more than double that figure. And that's not what we want. So the industry is committed to a plan, which you can see here, to first stabilize emissions at the level of 2020, and then by 2040, starting to reduce it to reach a reduction of 50% ultimately. Uh, you could say, okay, stabilizing, it's, it's not very ambitious, but when you look at what we have to do to achieve it, to offset 4% or 5% growth year on year, it's a lot. So there are several factors. Uh, the graph is not easy to read, but what you see on the top, the blue and uh, um, black uh, on the graph, it's known actions. It's technology we know about. We have to do the research. We have to de deliver it. it. It will take time and money, but it's quite sure. Uh, there are also operational measures. You can improve uh, air traffic management so that the aircraft are more efficient in their trajectories. You have less lo loitering, and so you burn less fuel. So that's what we know. But as you can see, there is a purple area, which is what we need to do on top of that to reach the ambitious target, not only to stabilize, but to reduce whilst, while keeping the growth. 
So that's the challenge, and that's what we are talking about today. We need to find new technologies and solutions to do more. So I say that uh, that figure of 2% in itself is an achievement, and you can see it on this graph. This graph is showing the evolution of the energy used per, per passenger kilometer for aircraft since, since the 50s. So I, I'm showing aircraft with turbojets. So what you can see, it's not easy to read, but what you can see is that we've reduced uh, the energy used per passenger kilometer by a factor of five. And as an example, you see here our latest generation of engine, the CFM LEAP engine, which is a powering A320, NEO, Boeing 737, and the new Chinese C919. And this engine in itself is giving 15% uh, fuel burn reduction compared to the previous generation, which itself was a major breakthrough compared to the previous one. So basically, we've done a lot. But now the question, and also what I would like to say is, there has been some work also on the aircraft, but propulsion has been the main factor for improvement. Now the question is, all the drivers we are using to achieve that, which is larger fans, lighter materials, high temperature, so it's a lot of technology, it's going to get to an asymptote. So we've got 10, 15% more, but then to go beyond, we need new stuff. So what are the ideas to reduce CO2 beyond uh, the next generation? A few ideas. First, let's use different fuels which don't release any CO2. So the obvious one is uh, hydrogen. It's new, not a new idea because in the US, uh, in the 50s, there was a project called Suntown to develop uh, a fighter, enfin, an observation plane, a spy plane, using liquid H2. And that program was cancelled because they faced a big problem, which is the issue of the density of liquid hydrogen. The density of liquid hydrogen is the same as ping pong balls. So, if I take an A320 and I use liquid hydrogen instead of kerosene, I would have to use the full fuselage just to put the fuel. So as the idea is, you know, to have a few passengers, I would have to have a double decker and double the size of the aircraft. I mean, it's uh, not the exact figures, but you can see it on the picture. And so if the aircraft is bigger, it's, the drag is bigger, so you're losing efficiency, you're reducing the range. If you reduce the range, you put more fuel, and so on and so forth. So ultimately, it's not very practical. So another option is to look not at uh, fuels that don't release any CO2, but use fuels which have a life cycle which is uh, de um, delivering less CO2. So this is not specific to aviation. The idea would be to use biofuels. So biofuels are produced using biomass, and so depending on the full life cycle and the way you, to do it, we think you can reduce the total CO2 generation over life cycle by 50 to 80 percent. Let's say 50. So it's better. It's not as much as 100 percent, but it's 50 percent. So clearly, biofuels are one of the elements for the future. But there are many barriers to do it. We have already demonstrated that biofuels can be used in actual commercial flights. There were experiments. The problem is we need to ensure that every type of biofuel we qualify for aviation are meeting safety and durability requirements. We are not flying cars, we are flying aircraft. Passenger on board, safety first. So there is a lot of barriers and cost to use those fuels because you need to demonstrate they are equivalent to kerosene. Another question is availability. Obviously, you don't want to have biofuels where, in fact, you're uh, having a detrimental impact on the environment. Or you are using agricultural surfaces which could be used for food. So, and finally, the question is cost. 
at the moment, the, the sources of biofuel we know are much, much ex more expensive than kerosene. And so it's a question of acceptability by the customers. Do we accept to pay more for flying? Maybe at one point we do, I hope so, and then we will have more biofuels. So if we don't use uh, LH2, if you use some biofuels, but not much, could we go to electricity so I don't use fuel at all during the flight? I, I imagine everybody knows about uh, solar impulse by now. And so the question is, could we, could we fly with solar panels? Uh, the picture is showing you the issue. At the same scale, you, sh you see solar inputs and the F 380 aircraft. So you see the size of the wings, and you have one passenger with little amenities, whereas you have 600 on the F 380. So if I want to, to power an A320, Airbus F320, with solar energy, I would need more than a soccer playground of solar panels with optimistic assumptions. So it may be a contribution, but it's not the solution. So let's make it simpler. Let's use batteries or fuel cells. Electric storage, it already flies on small, smaller aircraft, general aviation. You know the Airbus E-Fan, but there are other examples of smaller aircraft flying electrically with uh, up to one hour of autonomy. The problem with batteries is energy density. To be able to fly with a larger commercial aircraft, you will need to increase the energy density of current technologies by a factor of 6 to 10. And at the moment, we don't see any technological path to do that. Doesn't mean it won't happen, but it's not for tomorrow. But for smaller aircraft, it's already a reality, and it's going probably to develop. Fuel cells, it's another option, because fuel cells, you, you provide the fuel, so energy density is much better. The problem with fuel cells, it's not energy, it's power. Because we need not only energy, we need very high power density. To give you an example, when you take off with an Airbus 320, with our engines, each engine develops 20 megawatts of power, useful power, at takeoff. So to, to, to get uh, an idea of what it means, it's 80 port Porsche 911. So 80 sports car, 160 sports car to, to just to lift an F320 to take for takeoff. And we do that with a small engine. So the power density is huge. And fuel cells are quite poor for that. That doesn't mean that fuel cells are not part of the equation. It could be used for, not for propulsion, but for providing other energies on board. You may not know that today, all the energy on board of an aircraft comes from the engine. So the engine is supplying power for flight, but also for cabin, air conditioning, everything. So in the future, we think we could use um, fuel cells to supply electricity for uh, kitchen, air conditioning, and so on, and have the engines focused on prop propulsion. You see here uh, a recent flight test by DLR uh, with a fuel cell uh, uh, working with hydrogen. So, okay, I'm, I don't think at the, at the moment you, you, you feel that uh, we've got many options uh, available for the future. But the answer is, it is it's not easy. So, batteries too heavy, liquid hydrogen density, so volume is too high, fuel cell, it's too heavy. So what could we do? The answer is probably a mix of everything. So if I make it simple, I look at smaller aircraft. You, you see examples here. I could use electricity for those aircraft, so I have no CO2, so it's great. If I go bigger, I could use a gas turbine, so an engine to supply electricity to electrical motor, so I've got the autonomy of a conventional engine, but I use electricity for propulsion. 
So you would say, what's the benefit of that then? The benefit is what you see here. I can have, for instance, 20 propellers instead of two engines. So what I can do is reduce drags. I can use some of the propellers for vertical takeoff. So I, catch, I can change the way we fly. And this is something we think could happen very soon. And we are interested in that and we're working, including with startups. Now, of course, we are looking at that because what we are interested in, in the end, it's the big ones. So the big ones is not for tomorrow. But for the big ones, probably the idea is to mix conventional propulsion with batteries and electrical motors. It's what we call hybrid propulsion. And it's a bit the same as idea as for a car, except that it's a bit more difficult. So on a car, what is nice with hybrid uh, cars is when you decelerate, you recuperate energy. Problem with an airliner is you take off, you cruise, you go down. And if I recuperate energy, I go down faster. So, and as you know, the airport is where it is. Okay? So it's not much about recuperation. Again, it's how you can reduce the constraints, design constraints for the aircraft, and optimize the management of energy during the flight. You may have smaller engines because you use electricity when you need it to put a boost, to give a boost. And so a smaller engine will be more efficient. The message here is we're still talking about aircraft, so the technologies we need to do that are extremely advanced because aircraft need very high uh, power and energy densities. And so we will have to develop new electrical motors, new electrical generation with power density multiplied by two or three compared to what we do today, and able to fly at high altitude without problems due to uh, um, harking, for instance. So there is a lot to do, and it will take time, but there are also opportunities in the short term for smaller players to develop solutions for new ways of flying. And we believe that one of the segments where it's going to happen is helicopter-like applications. So you all know uh, all those small UAVs you can, you can buy for fun with multiple rotors. Uh, you could fly the same way with passengers on board or, or freight. But to do that, you need to have electricity to distribute propulsion. So once you get that, you can, there is no limit to imagination about the type of aircraft you can do. And so, as I've seen already, there are many startups working on various concepts of vertical takeoff and landing, I would say flying cars, uh, multicopters, whatever. And probably, out of all those projects, there will be some real businesses, and those businesses are going to be the seed of a potential revolution that may take years, but we are very, very aware that we need to be there. Because when we see that it's ready, if we're not there as big players, it will be too late. Okay, so that's all for me. Thank you for your attention.